they asked me to say if I would uh, share 20 pieces of advice that I wished I'd known when I was in my 20s. And uh, I said, well, I'm not in my 20s, so how about 40 pieces, right? And then I got on a roll because the ideas were just flowing. And then I thought, you know, I could probably pull this one off. <laughs> um, and then Connie saw me working on this, and she says, uh, no. <laughs> Let's stick with 20. And there's a timer someplace. Oh, yeah, I see it going there already. But I am the last speaker. And, uh, yeah, like James says, I'd rather be in the back. But I also know that um, I've been given a, a gift, I consider it a gift, of uh, being able to... Um, wanting to change the world and making a difference in people's lives. So I just want to share some of those things. So in no, rand in no specific order, in very random order, um, we will just talk about this, like, just like James says. One of the things I, I wished I'd kept uh, earlier in my life, I know because all, all children when they, when they are, you know, are young, they're always curious, right? And there was years that I wasn't curious. And I've rediscovered that, and I preach it, and I teach it, and I encourage people to always stay curious. Uh, I just love reading, and I, people are talking about it. Are you going to share some books today? Nah, I got a couple here. And I find that reading doesn't quench that curiosity. It actually stimulates it, right? And it really helps me um, um, yeah, grow in who I am. I just want to, with a caveat there, caveat, be careful what we, like with social media and all that stuff, be selective. Be selective of what you're curious about, right? Because there's some goofy, <laughs> goofy stuff out there. Be grateful was another thing that um, I've learned. I find that it really helps me um, focus. It makes me a lot more intentional. I find that if I'm not grateful, I am not as creative, I'm not as in the moment. I, I struggle to, to listen. Um, and I said it, it, it for me, it's, um, it's really a cornerstone of, to me, uh, of, a, of a life well lived. And for me, I know that if I get up in the morning and I think of some things that I'm grateful for, I can go into a meeting totally different, right? If, I, if I'm focused on all the issues and the problems, it really changes. So for me, if you can just be grateful, this one's basic, right? But when I was in my 20s, I thought sleep was a waste of time. I really did. Like, there were so many things to do, so many things I wanted to do, places I wanted to discover, and I thought it was a waste of time. And I've learned that if I don't get my sleep, I'm not as creative, I'm not as productive, I'm not as efficient. And so for me, it's just a simple thing, and I just wanted to share that. <sighs> I struggle with this, so that's why I... I, I haven't mastered this one. This one is, gets me, right? Um, I find it so easy. If we're talking about things, and all of a sudden someone comes up with this idea that we have discussed like 20 minutes ago, right? And I go, no, Sherlock, right? Like, and I know I shouldn't even be thinking it because it changes everything. So I'm still working on it. And seriously, I find that it really undermines my leadership. It impacts my influence. Um, it robs other people of discovery. Uh, doesn't bring clarity to a situation. And, uh, but yeah, needless to say, I'm still working on it. <clears throat> Another thing I wanted to share was appreciate your heritage. For me, when I was in my 20s, uh, I was a lot smarter than my parents. I really was. Um, I thought I was anyway. And it wasn't until later on in life I've got to, um, to understand the importance of, of heritage, the importance of what my parents um, were trying to instill into my life. And I'm so grateful for that. Um, and so one of the things I, I would suggest, I'm going to I would really suggest you do this. If you have parents that are alive, if you have grandparents that are alive, uh, get them to record their story. Really do that. Um, I wasn't smart enough to do that. My sister, who's sitting over there, she talked, uh, she convinced my parents to write out their story, and they recorded it, right? And um, I have it right here. It's on my, 
iPod. Does anybody know what an iPod is? <laughs> and, I, and I listen to it, right? And it's when I hear my dad's voice, both my mom and dad are, are not with us anymore, um, it grounds me. I hear his voice saying, I'm 55 years old and I'm getting choked up. No, I'm not 55, but I'm getting choked up. <laughs> um, you know, he talks about regrets. He talks about uh, his, the first house that he built uh, and then hearing my mom's uh, story. So I'm so grateful. I, I'm totally blessed and a lot richer for it, the fact that my sister Joanne uh, got them to record it and uh, I listen to that quite often, especially when I'm traveling, right? And I'm feeling kind of lonely, right? So that to me is, a, is an important one. Okay, this is me. <laughs> There's always a squirrel, right? Oh, man, I went outside for a walk and I saw a couple squirrels. No, I didn't. I just, um... so you've, you've seen that t-shirt, right? ACDC, Highway to Hell, right? My kids were going to get me a t-shirt, ADHD, Highway to, oh, look at the squirrel. <laughs> That's my life, right? And it takes a lot of energy to, so I just said, I'm going to give myself the privilege. I'm just going to put a squirrel in there and we'll see what happens. I'll, something will come up here in my conversation and we'll talk about it, but I just gave myself permission to do that. Another thing I wanted to share is always be ready, right? I, I saw um, a slogan, a saying quite a while ago, and, I said, and it said, don't let today's laziness disqualify you from tomorrow's opportunity. And for me, procrastination, right? I know something's coming up. Procrastination is just a killer. It's been all my life. I still struggle with it today. Um, and I'm always reminding myself. So that, that one where it said, don't um, let today's laziness, that really hit me, right? Procrastination, I started to live with it, it's whatever. But I didn't want to be known as lazy. And so for me, that's been important. So always be ready. You never know what's going to happen tomorrow. It can be so many things, right? Uh, the laziness of, we have a client coming tomorrow, I should really study who they are so I can speak into the situation, right? There's, there's so many things that we can, um, we can do to be ready. Another thing is, uh, take risks. And for me, it's, like I'm not talking major risks, risks where you bet the farm. I'm talking about the risk of introducing yourself to someone. The risk of, you know, that feeling you get, I should do something, and you're not you're a little anxious of it. Um, I say, take it. Um, just to explain that feeling, I, I, I do read lots of books. I, I love books, and I usually have three or four on the go. Um, and I was reading a book, and I thought, this is really cool. You know, if I ever get a chance to meet this author, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to thank him for it, because this, this book really meant a lot to me. And so I put that away in my mind, and it wasn't long after I had the opportunity to hear him speaking. So I went to the event, and um, he was speaking multiple times, but I went to the early morning one, and I, he was there, and I thought, I'm going to do this. And so I waited till it was dismissed, everybody's going, and some people were lining up, and they all had a book. I'm going, seriously, I can't go there. I don't even have a book for him to autograph. Like, what an idiot. No, I'm not going to. I'm not going to. I'm trying to convince myself to it. I'm just trying to describe that feeling that I think sometimes we have and we try to talk ourselves out of something. So I went up to him, and he looks at me. I don't have a book. I'm going, this guy thinks I'm an idiot. But I just wanted, so I told him, I just wanted to thank you. I appreciated the book. It was a good book. And um, thank you very much. And I'm almost going to run away because I felt embarrassed. I didn't have anything else to say to him. And he said, hey, excuse me, he said, I have another session to do, but are you available for lunch? Let's go for lunch, right? So sometimes when we have that feeling we need to do something, just do it. Just do it, right? It's not life or death. Just do those hard things and you're, you'll always be rewarded. Another thing, boy, this is going pretty good. Yeah. Uh, attitude. For me, um, that's a lesson I learned, oh, so much later on in life, right? Stuff happens to us, and I try to change the stuff. I try to change the circumstances, and I realize that the only thing that I can really change is how I respond to those circumstances, how, they, how do they do that, right? And it can be a really simple thing. 
We live in Winkler, drive to Morden, commute, right? 10 minutes every day, three traffic lights. <sighs> Double lane. I, so my morning routine was I go pick up a coffee, I get on the road, I'm driving, but there's just idiots on the road, right? They're driving in the left lane. They don't want to drive a decent speed. Like, oh, I don't want to drive the speed limit, right? I, I mean, I'm, I want to get there, right? And they're a bunch of idiots, right? And it's so frustrating. And they stop at that lights in the middle between Morden and Winkler, and they both the same speed. Like, seriously, right? <laughs> and that was just bugging me. And then I'd get to work, and I'd talk about the idiots on the road, right? And, ser- you know, it just... And it, for me, it was... Um, I didn't even notice it was happening to me. And uh, one day, we were, we were talking about how fast it gets to work from between Morden and Winkler, and uh, they were having people that were going to drive 110. So for you Americans, it's only 62 miles an hour, or 65 or something. Um, and then someone was going to drive 120. I'm glad I didn't pick that. That was, yeah. Anyway, I said I'd do 100. So I did. I, I, I started, we timed it when we left. We were keeping track. We even had a spreadsheet, of course, right? You got you to gotta get all that. And I was watching the numbers, and I wasn't any slower than the rest of them. But what I noticed, I pick up my coffee, and it was on my second trip to work that I was driving, and I had a coffee with me. I had it always, but I never, ever sipped the coffee because I was getting to work, right? And there were idiots in my way, right? And I was, and all of a sudden, I realized the jerks aren't around. There's no jerks driving when I'm driving now, when I'm driving the speed limit. So for me, it was just such an attitude thing. I had to, I had to figure that out. And so many, so many times, um, I'm reminded about that. And one of our um, supervisors at one of our stand-up meetings in the morning at 8 o'clock, he gave a, an example of that. He said, if you had $86,400 and someone took $10 from you, would you leave it and go chase after and get that $10? Or would you just protect that... 86,390, right? He says, because that's how many seconds you have in a day. So someone cuts you off. Someone says something negative to you. Are you going to dwell on that for another half an hour and rob some more? Or are you going to just, right? It's a loss. Think about those, the, the remaining 86,390. So for me, that was a good uh, example. Of course, he said that right after I've been starting to process this, so it really drove the message home. Okay, I have time for another one. Uh, <laughs> this one is actually sort of planned. So this one is, these are some of the books that, uh, I know I had, to, I had to talk about books, right? Uh, it's not, I only start to read very later on in life. Uh, time goes so fast, I can't remember. Maybe I was in my 35s, Connie, what was it? Something like that. When I started to read, uh, I've never, I wasn't a scholar in school, I went the, uh, mandatory hours, um, years to school, but that was it. I, I didn't enjoy learning that way, but I really enjoy learning. So some these are the books that, I'm, that I've got on the go right now. Um, being new, it's, uh, yeah, it, 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 it talks about the, the um, uh, traditional buyer versus the, what they call the new um, economic order. It, 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 they talk about how the, the Apple versus the the IBM, that kind of thing. It's, it's, I find it very fascinating. Um, Everybody Matters is one of my favorites. I've read it numerous times. It talks about people, and I, I just, I love people. I love seeing, uh, you know, someone asked me, like, with the automation that you're doing, how are you feeling about that? And I said, I, I will, let's automate things that don't, um, first of all, that are easier to automate, right? But I says, when I see someone do a good job and the look on their eyes, the satisfaction that they have, I said, I never get that from a machine. And I need that. I need that satisfaction. I need to see people being excited and satisfied of doing a good job. So that's important to me. Um, The Divine Mentor is one that a friend gave me here about um, maybe six months ago. And I'm always looking for a mentor. And I think I'm, I'm hoping you all have someone that you can go to that really talk and ask questions, and, and uh, this one is to do with mentors in the Bible, right? And I never thought of it like that before, and so when I'm looking for leadership examples, um, I've, I've been really enjoying that book, so that's one of my, 
it's on the top 10. I haven't put them in order yet, and I don't think I ever will. And right now, this is in the top 10. Unreasonable Hospitality is a book that I'd really encourage all of you to read. It's, it's about 11 Madison Park, uh, the restaurant, and uh, their journey to uh, Michelin, right, the star, um, and how they treat, how they think about their customers and stuff like that. That's an excellent book. And of course, uh, my U version, my app uh, on my Bible. And Squirrel just showed up again. So I don't know if you've seen this book. The boy, who, who, who here has heard about it? Right? It's, it's um, the boy, the, the mole, the fox, and the horse. And it's, to me, it's really cool. And this is one of the quotes of my favorites, right? And it's about keeping life simple. Uh, for myself, I, I let life get really complicated and crazy when I was younger. I thought I needed to do that. And I'm realizing that let's keep it simple. And so for me, one of the favorite quotes in this book is, what do you want to be when you grow up? And kind, said the boy, right? And this book is full of that. So I would really recommend it. Also, uh, it's on um, Apple TV. I think it's about a 34-minute uh, movie. And I'd watch it. I'd recommend watching it with your kids, with your grandkids, with your nieces, with your friends, maybe with your parents. Uh, it's a really good Thing, uh, story and um, yeah, just get us grounded again. And I need to look at that um, quite often. <clears throat> this one here, um, I, I'm not a writer, uh, yeah, anyway, but I do write down, like I've got lots of ideas running all the time. So I, I find that I need to put them down on paper instead of telling everybody about them. Uh, I tell them some, I, I need to, just the way my mind works. So I write it out because many times I don't think I'm getting anywhere. And so at the end of the year, I can go through there and I can look at that list and I can revise it and stuff. But one of the things that I did a couple of years ago, and I wish I would have done it earlier, I uh, went to a session, it was a couple of days, and we talked about intentional leadership agenda. And what we, one of the exercises we had to do was write a letter um, that's going to be read on your retirement. Like, for me, I wasn't going to retire, so that was kind of crazy. But I wrote this letter, what I wanted people to be saying at my retirement. And uh, we, worked, we got together for a couple of days, worked through a bunch of things. And at the end of the session, someone in the group would take your letter and they had read it to you. You had to sit in the chair, right? Oh, it's a basket case. But it was so good. And I, I would really encourage you to do that. And I go back to that letter. I go back, oh, this is what I want to say. Uh, this is what I'm hoping. Because it gives me direction. It gets me focused again, right? I don't get, I lose, um, yeah, I lose my focus. I start focusing on things as opposed to people. Because in that letter, it, it had nothing to do with things. And so that for me is, is um, really important. On my leadership agenda, which came out of that, was that I said people will always know that they're loved, but I'm not going to let them, I'm going to give them opportunities to grow. I don't want them to stay where they are. I'm going to challenge them to, to move up, to, to do things. So I, I liken it to I put my arm around you, but I'm going to kick you in the butt, right? Because I want you to become all you can. And that, that to me just thrills me when I see that happening. So... Uh, I think that uh, letter uh, is, is important. I know that you can also do it um, online. There's, there's um, you know, services that do that. You can write a letter to yourself, and it'll send you back a year later, and it'll just focus you again. What was I thinking at that time, right? So I would really encourage that. <clears throat> Be intentional. I wished, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, that's why I'm having to work when I'm this age, because I wasted so much time when I was younger. No. Um, to, to be intentional, for me, um, I'll just a few little stories. Uh, when I'm with my grandchildren, I try to, we always try to elevate something, try to teach them something, try to, to um, yeah, be intentional what we do. Just like James said about, uh, the, the parade, right? We handed out those buttons. Today I'm going to change the world. Like we could put a, we could put a, and we need to, the, uh, have a float in the parade. But I said, let's do something that's going to cause someone to take an action. 
um, to smile at someone today, to wear these buttons. So we're always trying, whatever we try to do, we try to not waste time, not waste your energy, your time, but try to make a difference and be living really intentional. Uh, intentional of being grateful, intentional of being kind. Um, yeah, those, those are, for me, are uh, paramount, right? Here's another squirrel, but this one's on purpose. Again, this book. Seth Godin is one of my favorite authors. I might have shared this with you before. Um, it's a real, it's a, yeah, it's, it's, one, it's a book that's got all kinds of little stories. I've uh, read them, I've taken a story, it's two pages long, and read it with my grandchildren. I would recommend this book. And you can read that story, and then you can discuss it, right? And that's what I mean by intentional, right? I'm, I do have fun, though. I don't always just have to be so focused. Uh, we have a lot of fun. But for me, that is important. And one of, the, one of the things, one of the things, see, went from 13 to 20. I can do that, right? Uh, that's because there's all these little freebies I'm throwing in. All the place. Um, I'm going to do something that I'm really nervous about because my reading, I can read, obviously. I love reading. But my reading out loud is very difficult, so I practice it sometimes with Connie. So today I'm going to practice it with you a little bit. I'm going to be vulnerable. I'm going to read the story that I read in this book, in this, this book here, and then we will discuss it a little bit. Um, so this is a Greek philosopher. I'm going to mispronounce his name, but it's a story about five hammers, obviously. Uh, Pythagoras the guy who invented the hypotenuse, led a cult of brilliant but sometimes confused mathematicians. They believed that harmonics held the key to understanding how things functioned. At the heart of their work was the study of ratios, of dividing things into basic components in search of harmony of the universe. According to the myth, Py Pythagoras, <laughs> yeah, whatever that is, was stuck on a theory, and he went for a walk to clear his head. He passed by a blacksmith shop and heard five workers inside, all using hammers to bend iron. As their hammers struck in unison, the clang organized into a beautiful sound that all the hammers singing out in harmony at once. He walked into the blacksmith shop and with a bluster that would have been fun to watch, took all five hammers away. He wanted to study what made their harmony so beautiful. It might unlock the secret he was seeking. Over the weeks, he weighed and measured each hammer. He wanted to understand why they didn't sound identical, and more importantly, why the sound, they sounded so good when they all clanged in unison. His work, discovered, his, his work helped us discover a physical connection between math and the world. It turns out that the ratios of the weights of the first four hammers led to their ringing in harmony, and each had a weight that was a multiple of the other. More fascinating, though, was that the fifth hammer didn't follow any of the rules. The fifth hammer was spurious, data that didn't fit, something to be ignored. Like many researchers throughout time, he threw out the fifth hammer and published the work with only f the first four. But it turned out that the misfit, the fifth hammer, was the secret to the entire sound. It worked precisely because it wasn't perfect, precisely because it added grit and renaissance to a system that would have been flaccid without it. The harmonies of Crosby, Still, Nash & Young worked best because of Neil Young. Because his voice wasn't quite right, because, he had, because he's a loose cannon, his sound was not quite right, so it works. During their breakthrough tour in 1974, the trio traveled, the core trio traveled together, often by private jet, from gig to gig, but Neil refused to fly with him, leaving instead immediately after each concert and driving with his son to the next gig in a mobile home. He was the friction, the wild card, the fifth hammer. And for me, that when I read it the first time, I got emotional. I got really emotional. And I kept it a secret because I saw that that was me. Because I never quite felt like I fit in. I was told I didn't. I was told to be more like so-and-so. And I, I never quite fit in. And this is only a few years ago. And I finally got enough courage to share it with my family, my kids. And then I had the amazing experience of sharing this again uh, when we were all together. All, we had three children and three grandchildren. 
and we're all together, and they affirmed in me, and they, they, gave, me, they gave me permission to be that fifth hammer. So I just want to remind you, if you're that fifth hammer, right, you don't contribute beauty and magic by fitting in. The fifth hammer makes a difference by standing out next. That's you, right? So I just want to encourage you to do that. Be yourself. Uh, and um, I think that's, that's it for me t today. So thank you very much.